this is a session um, about uh, textbooks. Um, as I've said in several times before, uh, how uh, and why you would write a textbook, and then maybe in retrospect, what was I thinking when I agreed to write the textbook? Um, they're all smiling, so they understand what that means. But um, each of us, you know, we, we, we do things in our teaching and, and uh, we enjoy sharing with our students, we enjoy sharing with colleagues, and we're convinced maybe that we have such a good idea or approach, or at least, you know, it, it's worth sharing. And we organize it more than just at a conference. We, it starts to get out of hand. And we start to write a textbook. Some of us have commercial ventures, some of us it's OER, or, uh, some of it is uh, just, we share it personally. Um, and so I thought I'd just go around with the four and ask them for a few minutes each to talk about their venture and how they got to their text. And then we'd open it up and including uh, inviting others in the audience who've written the text, you know, what, what it is that drove them to do it. So uh, Tim, why don't, my screen has got Tim in the upper left. And so I'm gonna go Tim and Glenn and Joe and Kurt, okay? Sounds good. We can each take whatever, five or seven minutes, and then that should yeah. be plenty of time for other people to, to throw yeah. in ideas as well. Yeah. Um, can I, forgive me. No. Can we show a couple of slides? Yes. Okay. I think you can share screen if okay. you want. Yes. Uh, so so um, I'm now at Calvin University uh, teaching kind of in my retirement years, I guess. But I was for the last 10 years at Davenport University, which had uh, a smaller number of, uh, of uh, students. They were mainly people in, tech, in, um, in CIT and such. And so um, we didn't have an engineering program or even a, a, a big math, math program. And so the course that I wanted to, to teach as a DE course was something as a, um, as a what would you call it, a self-contained uh, What's the word I want? It's not meant to to prepare students for other courses that they'll be taking along the way, but it's a, a kind of a capstone course, as it were. Um, and so uh, it's my the textbook that I wrote, which is available, by the way, to anyone who wants to just write me. I can uh, give it to Brian as well for the Semiode site, but just my full name, Timothy dot Pennings, P E N N I N G S, Timothy.pennings at gmail.com. Just send me a quick note and I'll, I'll send you the PDF of it and you can use it however you want. But uh, what makes it maybe somewhat unique is that uh, it doesn't require either Calc 2 or Calc 3. The Calc 2 and Calc 3 that uh, is needed for the course, I build right in there kind of as a just in time thing. So when we do integration by parts or I introduce we have a little bit of uh, partial different uh, partial derivatives then I explain what they are as we go so uh, so that's there as as you need and that way students who've had just a good solid calc one course can jump right to this one right from calc one so that that makes it kind of uh, uh, nice for maybe uh, textbooks that aren't available for others um, the other thing I do, I, I could put it on the screen, but it, I, I don't need to it. Uh, but I start right out by the very first thing I say is what happens when you take a hot pan from the oven, a hot pizza from the oven. And every single thing that we do in the course is all motivated by physical examples. We don't we don't discuss anything theoretically until it's all motivated. And so uh, I don't need to, I don't spend time doing lots of techniques that are gonna be used in other courses, things like that. It's all really concentrating on let's understand the real world and let's use differential equations to, to solve problems that we can do in this particular course. So we hit all the traditional ones, uh, temperature and, and uh, velocity and populations and things like that. The very first day of class, as I just mentioned in the past, uh, uh, session, uh, I bring a hot pot to class and and have the uh, we we use talk about Newton's second law and uh, and see how close we can get to making accurate predictions as as the hour goes on. Uh, one of my favorite things I do in this course is a project that I developed called uh, uh, maximizing uh, optimizing a trip upriver, in which uh, we figure out if you are pushing a barge or uh, rowing a, a kayak or a boat, a canoe upstream against a current, 
what's the speed at which you uh, can opt, uh, get upstream with a minimum amount of energy. And it uses just two facts from physics. One is that, that work or energy is force times distance. And the other one is that for speeds such as what a kayak or canoe would do, that the uh, force due to friction is proportional to your speed. And using just those two, you get into some, you, you, you prove it's very nice that your optimal speed to go up river is quite twice the speed of the current. So you're basically going up river at the same speed with which the water is going down river. And uh, you can do that and then you can uh, solve the problem for a variable current and that works out very nicely and there are a lot of nice thought provoking questions that talk about why, uh, why is it that going a little bit too slow is much worse than going a little bit too fast because they see, the, they see that uh, if you go too slow, you're going to be spending a lot of time in the water because your effective distance is very large because the, 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 you're going just barely as uh, faster than the current. So anyway, any, anyone who wants to use that project, uh, you may either uh, get the book, the textbook PDF from me, or you can find that in literature elsewhere. It's in uh, UMAP and also um, uh, um, Math Horizons has an article on it. So uh, anyway, I, let's see, anything else? I, I've got linear algebra in there as well. So I've got the linear algebra that you would need uh, for the course, a couple of interludes that that give the, the basics of that. And uh, so it's a, that, that's the word I was looking for. It's a self-contained course. It, it's really meant to be something that you take all by itself and you kind of learn how math, how differential equations can model the real world. And it's all kind of contained. And, and this is meant to be the, the final course that, that students take. They can use it to go on for other ones, but it's really kind of designed to be kind of a, a standalone course. What is the title of the book? What is the title of your book? The title, I just call it uh, Differential Equations and Modeling. But it's not published, though. It's just uh, I'll, I'll send you a copy of it if you want it. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Tim. Let's let's move on. By the way, the, the references to the stream, are those articles you've written or you could just go uh, optimize upstream and look for Google or something? Yeah, if you just put uh, optimizing a, a trip up river, I think okay. you'll, you'll find it that way. And there's a request to put your email address here. Glenn, Glenn Letter out there in Nebraska. Yeah, hi. Um, my uh, my book is actually quite a bit similar to what Tim described, except that it's specifically for mathematical biology. And uh, the way it got, it, so the first edition was called Mathematics for the Life Sciences, and then it had a colon with some descriptors. And uh, the second edition is enough different that we've given it a different name. It'll be out in April, and it's called Mathematical Modeling in Epidemiology and Ecology. Uh, this book grew out of what at that time was called a CCLI grant from NSF, course curriculum and laboratory instruction or improvement, something like that. It's been replaced by a different acronym. Uh, and my, my charge was to create a, originally the idea was to create a two semester curriculum for biology students uh, that would serve as their mathematics in place of Calc 1 and statistics, which is what they take now, or what they took at the time. Uh, and uh, I had some biologists who were pretty quantitative to discuss this with. And what I ended up settling on was that the students could take just a regular calculus course for the first semester. And then in the second semester, they should take mostly a dynamical systems course uh, because you can teach dynamical systems without having had integration theory and calculus, without having had multivariable calculus. Uh, for example, partial derivatives are really easy. If you could take the derivative of pi y and get pi for the answer, then you could take the partial derivative of x y and get x for the answer. You don't need a whole course to explain what a partial derivative is. Uh, so my book grew out of this intention to create a post-calculus one course that would be sophisticated enough to do dynamical systems. And uh, at that time, I also had probability in it because the, the, that way the students wouldn't be missing probability statistics altogether. Uh, the second edition uh, has 
uh, was spurred on by the COVID-19 pandemic, I wanted to include a lot more epidemiology in the books than what was in the first edition. In the first edition, epidemiology was primarily a source of problems. But in the second edition, there are a lot of sections that are specifically about epidemiology. Uh, and I use them as epidemiology models as examples whenever possible. Uh, I want to just add a couple of bits of, of uh, wisdom that I gleaned from the book writing process in case I don't get an opportunity to say it later. So there are two things I wanted to say here. Uh, one is don't write a book to make money uh, because you won't make money. And, and in particular, if you write the book before you are promoted to full professor, you will lose money because you wrote the book because, because it'll take you longer to get promoted to full professor. And the second thing is that uh, the way you the way you you interact with publishers is extremely important, and there's a there's a, a best way to do that, especially for new book authors. The best way to do that is to write your table of contents in one chapter before you talk to anybody, then send that table of contents in one chapter to book edit to editors at different publishing companies and they'll send it out for reviews and you'll get some sense of who's interested in it and then don't talk to that and then say okay I'm going to work on it some more and then don't go back to the book publishers until you have a first draft completely finished because from the moment you sign the contract until the book is published you want to have that company be as stable as possible. You don't want three years to elapse between when you sign a contract and the book is published because they'll have a lot of changeover and the people who work at the company uh, and the editor that signed you will be gone and you'll have a different editor who's not invested in, in your book. Oh, that's very good practical. Advice. <laughs> good, very good advice. Well, well, I, I learned that the hard way. Okay, all right. Well, thank you, Glenn. Um, uh, let's go, uh, Joe. Okay, I'm, I'm, forgive me for putting up, just I'll share the screen here. Oh, that's fine. Okay. So I've actually written three textbooks. Uh, nobody asked me to do any of them. Uh, it was all of my own volition. The first one uh, here was in 1966, the first edition of Feedback and Control Systems for Dan Shalm. Actually, I have to admit that Dan Shalm did ask me to do this when I uh, first met him. And then I got two co-authors. One was my mentor for my master's uh, degree. And another was a colleague I had just recently met who just got a PhD in, uh, uh, in control, control theory from, from Berkeley. And together we put this, uh, th uh, this book, Feedback and Control Systems together. Uh, the second edition, then we, we included um, uh, a discrete time system. So, uh, and some people didn't like that. They wanted to keep it continuous. I did get some mail about that. Uh, but this was a project that I started when I was a grad student, and I did it because I, I loved, I knew that I would love teaching, and I liked expressing things. I liked writing, and I liked teaching. Um, so today, I got a, um, McGraw-Hill sent me uh, a, a contract to sign, which I'm not signing yet because I don't understand it, um, to uh, for the fourth edition of this. Uh, so hopefully I'll have a, a, a conversation with the uh, editor uh, tomorrow at McGraw-Hill because I really, really, really don't trust them. I, I learned by very bad uh, experiences with them and also with Elsevier on my second book, uh, Dynamic Systems, Biology, Modeling and Simulation, which I considered my opus. This was a book that I've been writing all my life. Uh, when I started teaching at UCLA, I think in 66, I started teaching, while well, it was mostly control theory, high, high level stuff. I stopped doing that because it was leading, it was attracting too many people from too many countries that wanted to use it for war. So I got out of that and got myself involved into, uh, in biology. And uh, so I taught uh, from, uh, from uh, actually from, uh, from uh, uh, documents that I would produce and update every single quarter or semester at the time and eventually turned it into this book, um, in, which was published in 2014. It's about 900 pages. Uh, it's pretty much everything that I knew at the time uh, about um, uh, modeling biological systems. And it's a re reasonably advanced book. I still teach from it uh, in the springtime when I teach a course to students uh, who have a lot more mathematics uh, than uh, when I turned uh, here 
In 2016, I gave up the the uh, uh, the chairmanship of a of a program that I had been running for 35 years. First called cybernetics in a departmental undergraduate program, and then computational systems biology. Uh, the dean at the time didn't like the fact that we were kind of elite. And we had only about 50 students uh, uh, in the program most of the time. Uh, she wanted more and she got them when I gave up the, the chairmanship and the new person listened and watered down and took out a, a, a whole year of mathematics from the program. <laughs> and uh, so at that point I said, I better write a book that they that everybody can understand. And, and so, I, uh, so I made it quite accessible put actually there's a lot of mathematics in it at the end. Uh, but in the beginning, I just introduced differential equations in a simple way, which I'll show you in a couple of slides. And uh, uh, and and I present the domain knowledge in it, which I think is really essential. If you're going to be modeling biological systems, you need to know what the biology is about, because it's, it's really a matter of a homomorphic transformation from the biology into diagrams into eventually mathematics. And I use Simulink uh, and laboratory sessions, which the students love. They like the labs more than they love me uh, and my lectures, because in the labs, they actually get them to implement the models that we talk about. And, th and they don't have to solve any differential equations for, for the most part. So I start very early on with a, with a typical example because I'm doing mechanistic modeling. And I so nomenclature is really important in, in, in my teaching. And it's important to understand the difference between the system, the environment, and the goal of the system. So here I have a, 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 a guy driving a car, a two component system, the road's the environment, the goal of the system is to navigate the fixed road. So what we do is we model this, uh, uh, we model this uh, with some block diagrams. So I teach them block diagrams and block diagram algebra, which is pretty easy. And so here's the simple block diagram. And then I quantify this uh, well, or, or semi-quantify this by showing them how to put symbols in here uh, in the modeling process. And, uh, and, and that's about it at that particular point. And discuss this in, in, in uh, uh, and, and so this is my, 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 uh, my MO for uh, uh, drawing diagrams and, and, and analogs, for example, room temperature, room temperature control and body temperature control. Uh, and then getting into some, when I get into deeper modeling, and here's a feedback control system model of, of glucose regulation in the, mo in, in, uh, uh, in the body. Uh, and it's substantially more complex than the, the simple ones that we're used to seeing, uh, but it's pretty easy to see this way and uh, model uh, uh, the, the uh, model the stuff in the boxes and uh, put it all together in, in a Simulink diagram. So pretty much that's how that's my 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 approach. Let me just get out of here now and say a few words. Uh, uh, come back to uh, stop stop sharing. Yeah, so I had the same advice that Glenn has about about publishing, and I had such such terrible experiences with McGraw Hill and Elsevier, which I could tell you privately uh, uh, that I decided no way was I ever going to publish with a large publication company. So I'm publishing now on Amazon myself, and primarily because I own. The, the copyright. Of course, I don't make any money on this. A little bit, a little bit more than I made with the publishers. But the publishers really don't. Uh, as Glenn said, the, the their population of uh, of editors and uh, uh, and and folks out in the field are are changing over so often that you just really don't get any service from them in selling your book. Uh, so. Uh, I don't do it anymore. Uh, Amazon has, has has its other difficulties, but never mind. It's easy, relatively easy, and I really I've been with them now for the last uh, four years, three years, and I'm up to my third edition, and I'm already writing the fourth edition because there's so much more to plunk in there. Uh, but I keep making it simpler and simpler and simpler, and that's the idea. Uh, I I try not to teach math, uh, so I want the students to have some basic math to come into this. They need uh, actually two quarters of math from UCLA um, 
uh, but most of the students who are taking it are from so many more departments. And since CS is my major department, I have CS students taking it. And so I can I can have 100 students a quarter if I, if I, would, uh, if I could manage it, but I can't. So I, I set the limit at 50. And I'm really, I've been surprised in the past few years how the CS students who might want to code, 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 code are actually interested in what we're doing in the modeling class. And particularly if those who are interested in machine learning and they understand now that there is something that you could in the box that maybe we can figure out what's in the box and how we can help machine learning algorithms uh, using mechanistic modeling. And that's in fact, an area that I'm, I'm uh, currently researching. Okay. That's about what I have. Thank you. So I hope that so our, we've had uh, two out of uh, three so far bashing commercial uh, <laughs> publishing houses. Uh, um, and I think the transitory nature is probably as much a problem because the personnel that you trusted and dealt with moves on. Okay, let's move to Kurt. Kurt already had a session the other day with uh, some users from Florida of the textbook that he's written for Simiode. This is a Simiode sponsored conference. So we thought, okay, uh, let's feature the Simiode text. And besides, we're proud of it. Um, so tell us about the text writing. And don't say anything bad about the publisher or the publisher. <laughs> oh, It was just awful. No, uh, so <laughs> brief background. I, I came to Rose Holman Institute of Technology 30 years ago. Uh, Brian Winkle was a professor here. Uh, I had, prior to that, I'd worked in industry for six years and I spent three years at NASA Langley uh, as in a postdoc. And I used a lot of differential equations in industry and at NASA. And so I had plenty of experience with the material, but when I got here, and that was the first course I was slated to teach because it is an engineering school, and my presentation of the material the first day was going to be pretty traditional, like this is a differential equation, here's what order means, here's what linear means, and Brian saw that and said, let me show you how I do it. And so that's what got me hooked on uh, doing applications to to in in the cloud, not just as an afterthought, but rather to motivate everything. So, I go in the first day, and I've got a, let, let's model Usain Bolt's Olympic victory, in and and see you know why 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 does he run faster than other people? How fast could he run? Two hundred meters, four hundred meters, stuff like that. Stuff that hooks the student's interest. And so he got me started on doing that. And I I counted uh, a couple of days ago in. 30 years, I've taught the course 102 times. So I built up a lot of material related to differential equations from teaching it and using it in industry. And so Brian brought when after Brian left, you know, I continued teaching it. And then I I, I did I did retire last year, although somehow I'm still in an office at Rose Holman and I'm still teaching that course. I'm not quite sure how that worked. <laughs> but in any case, he approached me, he said, how would you like to write this, write a textbook for Simeon? I've been involved with Simeon uh, for several years doing, doing, you know, writing up projects and such. And I thought about it. I'd written another textbook about 15 years ago on discrete Fourier analysis and wavelets and image processing. And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed writing the textbook. I don't have any horror story about publishing with Wiley. I just wrote the book and they published it. It was that simple. But uh, I enjoyed that. So I said, mm, okay, I'll write a book for you. And I, I enjoyed writing the Simeo textbook. So what I, what I, what motivated me to write it was um, I'd spent, I'd spent time in industry and at NASA and I had a view on, you know, I, I teach engineers. And so I had a view on what they need to know about differential equations beyond the normal stuff. So for example, when I got out of college, I went into industry and one of my first tasks, I was working for a company that makes chainsaws. And one of the things we were doing was making up a computer model of a chainsaw. How does it, how does it cut? How does it engage with the wood? How does it vibrate? And one of the things I encountered was I had a system of between two and 400 nonlinear ODEs that govern the motion of the chain around the bar. And I was trying to solve those numerically and I'd taken a numerical analysis class as an undergrad and I, I had, I wrote my, I coded in C, my trusty Runga Kutta fourth order method to solve this nonlinear system. And it just blew apart. I mean, the, the, the solutions just exploded immediately. And 
I, I tried and tried and tried to fix it. I eventually had to take a different approach to the problem. I never did know why my fancy RK4 method would not solve these equations until I got, I, I was in grad school a few years later and I realized the equations I'd been trying to solve were stiff equations, which, uh, you know, I had I, none of that stuff as an undergraduate. Uh, and, and so then I knew, and, and, I, and I was still working at the company while I was in grad school. So at least I, I was able to address the problem in a more sophisticated way. So that's one of the things I wanted to put in the book is, you know, some, something about what, what, do you, what do you do when you're solving a system of numerical equations and, and it's stiff? What does stiff mean? What do you do about it? Uh, I put in things, I'd, all, other things I found useful, like uh, scaling and non-dimensionalizing differential equations. Dimensional analysis was extremely important in, in, when I was working on stuff in industry and other, other things I thought were useful. And so that was my motivation was that to take 30 years of experience and the time in industry and, and at NASA and distill it down into what I thought DEs for, in this case, STEM majors should be. And um, I can testify that the money is not why you write the book. It's because you have something to say. I'll, I'll say that right now. So that's my story on uh, why I wrote the book. Well, thank you. I think with regard to Kurtz, it also helps to have a good editor, whether it's a commercial one or not. And we have uh, we had an editor who's a, a woman friend of mine who taught at West Point, who has a PhD in logic and is a professional copy editor, as well as a faculty member at New Mexico State. And Sheila, Kurt would write uh, chapters. I would edit it as best I could for my journal editing experience. And then we'd send it off to Sheila and we'd come back and we'd both say, why can't we write like that? You know, <laughs> uh, so it's remarkable how someone can help you communicate better. I saw Glenn flipping up, uh, you know, it is, it's just good to have an external and uh, that, that helps as well. Um, okay. Can I, can I yes. you have something else? Yeah. It's also good. It's, it, it would be great if you have a good lawyer. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, in fact, I'm going to make an offer here. Academics are about the dumbest people in the world with respect to uh, signing a contract to write a book. Uh, you know, we, we don't. We're, we're not in it for the money, and yet they screw over us really big time. Now, what I mean by that is. You, you think that when you submit some equations, you know, to a big company, for example, like Elsevier, Academic Press, that's where I got the book. That I submitted, I worked so hard on getting those equations so clean. And what did they do? They threw them away and they reread them all. You got to have a contract that doesn't permit them to do this to you. And that's just one, one example. There are plenty more. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think they do that anymore because you write your book in LaTeX, and uh, and so they they don't redo the equations. In my case, they did mess up a lot of things. Uh, a copy editor introduced something like fifty errors, and so after you get the proofs back, you have to be really careful, uh, and you want to insist that the publisher give you a copy in which the changes are highlighted so that it's easier to find the errors introduced by the copy editor. Yeah. There's an idea, okay. Well, I, but I, I, I would like to disagree with you, Glenn. Uh, uh, with, with, I use math type and, and, and word, and I'm still able to do that. And I'm really careful about checking my stuff. Of course, I make errors, and, but I want to fix my errors, not their errors. Yeah. I had a couple of thousand <laughs> equations in that book and there were hundreds and hundreds of errors. I mean, almost nothing got typeset correctly. Why? Because it was done by people who know nothing. Who don't know math. In but that's why you write the promise book. wouldn't happen. That's why you write in LaTeX rather than Word. No, I got it. I got it. But yeah. uh, but you have to uh, you have to you have to uh, you have to get all the details down. Where they're going to do it? Who's going to do the typesetting? The USA, India, China, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things, because you can count on on, on uh, it not happening if, you, if it's not in the contract. Um, the, the idea of money is, is something of interest. Uh, Kurt is, uh, has written this book and we have a, a, a certain percentage that comes to the author, a rather standard figure. But one of the reasons that I wanted a textbook was to make money for Simeon, not because I draw any money, but it needs money. We had an NSF grant 
And basically, I went to a workshop, a massive workshop, they called a boot camp. And one of the things is, uh, NSF didn't run it, but a group funded by them, and they go, what do you do when the money runs out? Okay, and, and uh, so what we do at Simeode is we have three, and I won't say the word money making in that sense, but three sustainability efforts. There's this conference, we charge you a modest uh, fee. We have certain costs, uh, the platform and so forth, and we may come out close. Then we have a Scutum, which is a student run competition. It's, it's not run on the scope that COMAP's competitions, COMAP runs a competition and has 28,000 teams at $100 a pop. You do the math, okay? We had 160 teams at $75. So we are not even on the on scale. However, it, 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 all of these, and then there's the text. Uh, and all of these are about our mission, just as Joe's and Glenn's and Tim's are. They're about what we believe. They're, you know, we're putting our heart on our sleeve. Um, we're putting years of experience in it. Um, and in my case, as the director of this project, uh, I want to be able to eventually offer some faculty member a stipend, like a journal editor would get. You know, if you work as a journal editor, you get reductions. And so I'm trying to generate some funds, but at the same time, keeping costs uh, down. Um, so that's our financial arrangement. And, um, and once in a while, uh, Kurt gets a check for, uh, was it 50,000 the last time? Maybe I'm off, <laughs> but I no, he gets a check for some order of magnitude uh, with, a, with a deep appreciation. And um, we are working at, you know, promoting this as a viable text and a modeling first uh, syntax. And we all have to work on promoting stuff. And, you know, I, I'm grateful for Joe and Glenn and Tim for being here to number one, share great ideas and help promote what they're doing so that it gets into the hands of, of folks and to the heart of a matter to students. Um, so uh, between before I open it up to I see Jim Sandifer in the audience, and I maybe see, I don't see Tom Judson, but uh, any other, other comments you have? I and mean, we have another half an hour here. We're not in any hurry. But, yeah. uh, thank you, Brian, for, for giving us this opportunity. I'd like to ask a question, if anybody can help me answer this. Uh, how do you market your books? Uh, because that's really difficult. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I realize, of course, that m my book is not going to sell very many or get, get much out there unless it gets adopted in courses where modeling is being taught. And uh, uh, I'm hoping to have mine adopted in life science departments because that's how I wrote it. And uh, um, uh, the reviews, like the academic reviews I got, understand that and uh, are basically promoting it for teaching in life science departments. But I don't know. I don't know how to get to them. Glenn, can you help with that? Uh, no, I am horrible at that. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's a few people here in the audience who who discovered my math modeling modules for COVID-19, uh, and I did everything I could think of to push that. And I don't think very many people found out about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I made a YouTube video uh, showing how to use it, all sorts of things. Uh, I didn't do anything on my own to promote the first edition of, of my math bio book. Uh, this time I've already done more than, than what I did before because Brian suggested that it would be okay if I did some same shameless self-promotion in, in my two talks here this, this weekend. Yeah. Uh, but I think an, another thing that I plan to do that I didn't do last time is find out what journals publish book reviews uh, and who is in charge of those. And then just write to that person and ask them if they would please consider doing a book review for your book. Uh, I know, uh, uh, I think it was, was it, was it Primus? I, I can't remember who, some, somebody, some, somebody decided to, to publish a review of Kurt Bryan's book, for example, uh, and they picked me to write it. And if you go online and find somewhere and find that review, uh, it's one of the best reviews. It's one of the most positive reviews that anyone has ever written about a book. <laughs> yeah. where, where do we find that? <laughs> it's, called, it's in the UMAP journal. And UMAP journal. If you go to Simeode's textbook page, 
there's pointers to that review. And, and basically, Glenn is saying that the author of this book can walk on water uh, in his slippers. Yeah. Do I have to send him money? No, <laughs> don't have to send him. Uh, but, but it isn't just flowery. It's it's nitty gritty. It's saying it has this, it has that, and I think. Yeah. And then point people to that. There is yeah. every opportunity. Say check about what so and so. So. Uh, so one thing that you really need as, as a book author, and this is where the bigger publishers have the advantage, is you really need reviews from people who might consider using your book. And the best, I, I don't know, you don't choose the reviewers, the publisher does that, but the, the best reviews come from people who agree with your motivation to write the book and think you could have done a better job. Okay. Those are the best reviewers. And then the most important thing is to pay attention to what they say. So uh, in my first review of Kurt's book, uh, if I had given a grade, it probably would have been a, a B plus, maybe an A minus. And I sent Kurt some suggestions and he took every one of my suggestions, which changed my review to an A plus. Yeah, mm. yeah they were good. Mm. And yeah. I learned something. Yeah. Could, um, could, I, could, I, could I interject? Because um, I'm sort of, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm uh, I, I want to first thank Brian for inviting me. I, um, I'm on the other side. I'm a biologist, so I'm not usually at a conference like this. Um, and I, uh, I'll be talking at five o'clock about the way in which I try to teach uh, math modeling to students who really do not want to learn it, which are biology students. Um, but I want to comment that part of the issue is that uh, only recently has there been a development of these systems biology programs. We have one at Case Western Reserve. And that's a, a place where you're starting to attract students who are actually interested in biological systems and in modeling. So if you're trying to um, get your textbooks in the hands of biology students who would actually care about it, finding faculty who are engaged in systems biology, especially in biology departments rather than in math departments, is where you'll have much larger catchment. Um, when I speak, I'll talk a little bit about what I've chosen to do in order to make my textbooks accessible to students. I, I, I was resonating a lot with what Joe was saying. I had thought about publishing. My mother-in-law is, uh, is a lawyer and a judge. And uh, so I had gotten uh, some interest. I showed her the contract and she was going through all the different changes you have to make, including the fact that you lose control of the book once they publish it and decide they want to do a second edition. You're not interested. They'll just take it out of your hands and it's somebody else's book. And I realized I really didn't want to do this. Anyhow, so if you stick around, I'll have some things to say about what I've done. But I think that if, in terms of trying to get this into the right hands, I would suggest people look into systems biology, um, the, the places where systems biology is being developed, because I think you'll have instructors, I mean, looking at the, the books you're describing, I think will be much more interesting to them. So just- my Yeah, thesis. another Thank thing you. is that, you know, there's public domain for, the, as Hillel was pointing out, you know, the systems department, there's a chairman, there's a uh, undergraduate uh, course director. Uh, usually the emails are there. It takes some time. My wife took a month long cruise with a friend and I was stuck at home. And so I spent time browsing departments around the world. And you just send them uh, the table of contents and the PDF of the first chapter, something like that to engender them. Um, if you can get a review, a short review or something somewhere, uh, you get one like Glenn has. I, I could sell the book and bridge with that one. And um, you, you you just have to shop it around. I mean, uh, if you have students that can help you, you have to decide how much you're going to pay someone to do that. But um, I think getting it out, we, we've been trying to get a review in Siam Review for two years now. And I keep sending the editor the complete PDF of the book, you know, and I say, send it to wherever you, you need. Um, and, you know, nothing happens. And I understand that. Uh, but uh, it, it's it's a, it's a work. It's it's maybe more work than doing the book sometimes. <laughs> if you um, uh, Siam review is more uh, uh, mathematical and more advanced. But there is applied mechanics review. Did you try applied mechanics review? Mm -hmm. This this is good. Uh, 
good place to for 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 also students to, uh, for textbooks and applied mechanics review is more accessible than the uh, SAM review. SAM review is very good. It's very good, but yeah. it takes two years, as you oh, said, yes. before, yeah. before you get <laughs> into it. Uh, also, either AMS or MAA does book reviews. I forget which. Um, and MAA. I know that because I wrote a couple of reviews for I'm them. Yeah, the, MAA, the MAA does. The MAA yes. does. Yeah. I'm a member of the Mathematical Association of America. And the last, the last part is is reviews. And yeah. Those actually are very influential I mean, because they usually the person who's doing it is someone they, they may themselves have written the book yeah. uh, and then they they review and they also compare. And so if they are very enthusiastic, um, it really suggests that it's worth looking at. Um, is Brian Borcher still in charge of the of the book reviews? Um, well, don't don't spend. Don't spend time on it. I thought maybe Darren, you'd know right away. Because Darren Glass is the person who's in charge ah, of it. Okay. The other thing is, you know, Joe is talking. Darren Glass? Darren Glass. Yeah. Just be, Jim may want to say something, or Frank, there's other authors who, but yeah. just um, the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, getting adoption is important. We just got Kurt's book adopted by Montana mm -hmm. State University. And there's 286 students taking a differential equation course out there in uh, in Bozeman, Montana. And so I we we sell the book through uh, our website, and it goes through Shopify. And it's uh, we had it printed by AccuTrack, which is not like Amazon, but it's somewhat mm -hmm. like that. And so I keep track of the orders and all that kind of stuff. Uh, although Lee Noble has set that up, and Kim Shelton is our tech salesperson at part time. So um, we're trying to keep costs down, but you know, it took us a year and a half to get a, a, a school with about 200 plus students to adopt it. Florida Polytech Institute was there and talking with Kurt uh, in the panel the other day and they've adopted it. They think so much of him that they're flying him down there to give a talk, I guess, uh, shortly, is that right? Next month. Yeah, yeah. So that's you, 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 you know, you have to kind of work at it that way and, and uh, suffer the trip to Florida in uh, March, you know. Um, I've but, had it easy though. All, I don't have to do any of the marketing or figure it out, any of the economics. I just sit and think about math and write about math. It's a dream job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, okay. Jim, you're going to yeah. you have a lot. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to just say a couple of things because my, my book is a little different than yours that, that I got into it because I was interested in discrete dynamical systems. So it's really a discrete version of a differential equations course. Um, and I wrote one and it was published in 1990 by Oxford University Press, uh, Discrete Dynamical Systems Theory and Applications. Um, and that one, it, it uses, so it requires, it's sort of a, in some sense, a capstone course. It requires students to have had calculus, uh, linear algebra, and uh, multivariable calculus. And it sort of shows them why all those courses were required of them. And then I wrote a parallel course that uses spreadsheets and uh, is for liberal arts students where they're doing much the same models, but they can do it easily because they're um, because they're discrete. Now, I've I also had problems uh, marketing my books, which is why they're out of print. I have gotten the copyrights back. I now have PDFs of both books. So if anybody is interested in those, just like Tim, I can send you the PDF for free and you can use them in your classes. Um, the, the first course, the discrete dynamical systems, uh, after I wrote it over the years, I kept looking at it and going, gosh, I could do better on this section and I could do better on this section. So I'm currently trying to rewrite that, uh, but it, it's a slow process and I keep getting interested in other things. That's a good sign though. There's nothing wrong with that, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Uh, one of the nice things about working with KDF Amazon is that you can update your manuscript at any time. So uh, I could send something to them today, and three days from now, the new one will be available. 
So I, I'm taking advantage of that. Just keep updating the manuscript in the current version. And then when, when I have enough new material in there, it'll be uh, third, fourth edition. Uh, Thank but, you. That's a great suggestion. Yeah. And, and it, so they're really great in that respect. Unfortunately, um, it's the review process at Amazon that is weak. Namely, Amazon communities, they allow reviews without reviews. So if you have somebody that doesn't like you, like a student who got didn't get the grade that they, they yeah. wanted, mm -hmm. you get a one star with no words. Yeah. That's, and they can just and, and you can't get rid of that. Uh, I had five stars on my book from 2014 since 2014. Last year, a whole bunch of one star ones went in without any uh, without without any numbers. And it went from five to four stars. So that's what happens on Amazon. Nothing to do about it. I've tried for two years yeah. now to get rid of those non-reviews. Will can... Amazon publish uh, excerpts like the table of contents or chapter one or anything like that? Yeah, in fact, that's really nice. When I uh, they, they they put my book, my, my third edition up on January 3rd. And on that day, what was available was not just the first couple of pages, but the first chapter. And that okay. was fine, fine with me. Yeah. And all the reviews that were in the beginning. So the reviews and the first chapter Reviews don't get seen because they don't go up in the review section. They, they're in the book only. So they got so they get to see the reviews. And if I can get people to look at those, look at the book on Amazon, then they'll see good reviews from, from academics. Um, that's tell us again yeah. about reviews and Amazon. Go through that again. There's yeah. the stars and the, and the ones and the fives, but are there serious reviews in Amazon of books? Oh, absolutely. No, no. So so in on Amazon, <clears throat> oh, they have one requirement. You had to have bought something in the last for, for $50 yeah. in the last six months. And uh, to write a review. Yes. Or to for them to accept it. Yeah. So so you you write your review and you give it a star. Uh the problem is that people can give it a star without any review, oh. and, but you can only complain about bad reviews that are written, not about bad stars. Okay. Okay, so it's just a, a way of canceling out the, the good stuff with, with, okay. with, by from enemies, <laughs> wherever they come from. Yeah, Putin may have put, put up those. <laughs> 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 can, can I ask the other authors uh, if they had my experience? I found I enjoyed the reason I did it. I enjoyed writing the book, but it was such a painful process that I had to wait until I'd forgotten how bad it was until I would, I would attempt to write a second book. Hmm. Yeah. Sounds like childbirth. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. When I, when I wrote my first book, which was a differential equations book quite a long time ago, uh, I swore afterwards that I'd never write another book, but then I got right. that grant from NSF and I had the idea for for uh, a math biology course and you couldn't find a book for it and I enjoy writing, so mm -hmm. I just did it. So, so I have right. a comments. Yeah, um, Fred. Starts out with the observation that there's an awful lot of us in this room that are retired. Yeah. <laughs> and we're talking about a book um, and essentially we're talking about a very passive kind of a document. And so the first comment I have, um, if there's anybody who's not retired, who's listening, is that you really should be thinking about writing a much more interactive kind of thing. So there's lots of wonderful examples out there. Many of them use Jupyter Notebooks or something like that. You can build really wonderful, highly interactive things that involve the students from the very beginning. So um, that's, that's my first comment. Um, my second comment is I, I can ha add um, sort of a pro and a con for publishers. Um, my first book, I had a wonderful publisher for a year. <laughs> and, and during that year, th this guy added a lot. I mean, it was the acquisition editor. He really believed in what, what I was doing. He made wonderful con uh, contributions. And then, of course, that particular outfit was bought by some other outfit and, and that got lost. So publishers are not necessarily, I mean, it, it, it can be good. Um, there's some very interesting publishers now. There's a whole open OER, open educational resources. Um, and that's 
there's some really wonderful books there and they're they're very attractive um it's obviously not designed for making money but none of us are making money anyway um and it is a way of getting things out there and more widely used and they're getting much more sophisticated in terms of supporting things like like Jupiter, like these highly interactive kind of things. And finally, of course, um, YouTube. Um, a really good way to reach people is YouTube videos. And it's, it's you know, things do go viral. And if you look at the success of an awful lot of the stuff out there, it's, 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 it's a, something we should be thinking of. So I think we need to think um, 21st century. Yeah. Speaking of uh, YouTube, I forgot to mention that I have YouTube videos for my entire book. I did wow. that during uh, COVID, and I just put a little thing on here in the chat. But uh, again, anyone who uh, sends me a request, I'll send you both the uh, the book and also uh, just give you the link to the YouTube videos. So it's all done from my kitchen. It's called Kitchen Calculus. I've got Calc 1, <laughs> Calc 2, Differential Equations, and a, and a college math course, all all on a whiteboard between my uh, cupboards and my counter. So uh, uh, not high tech, but uh, I think it, it works. The other thing I'll quick, I'll quick mention is um, just by way of pedagogy, on the first book of my, on the first page of my book, and this is something that maybe the rest of you do as well, but, but I really hit the word let with my class. To me, that's the magic word for differential equations. In fact, I even talk about the biblical reference. I say back in the, the Pentateuch, Genesis, you have these phrases, God said, let there be light and so on. And then I ask my class to say, now watch what happens when I hold out my palm and I say, let there appear a ping pong in my hand. And I have them all watching carefully. They, <laughs> they think a ping pong is gonna occur. And I say, let it appear. And nothing happens. And I say, there, I just showed you, I have no control over the natural world, but I do have control over the mathematical world. I can say, let X stand for this distance and let Y stand for the population. And there's the connection between the, the world of nature and the world of mathematics is that word let, and you kind of convince them you've got that power too, to make use of that power and the whole world is at your, at your disposal. So Victor, Victor, let, uh, Victor has his hands up here. Let's hear from Victor. Uh, Thanks. I, I want to follow up maybe a little bit about Frank's comments. So I, I gave some talks here about my math and sustainability course, and I'd love to get that information out in some way that other people could use it. Is that like modules? I have something in Comap. When like, people don't necessarily use books so much anymore is a bunch of modules useful or when does one go from having separate modules to a book and another question is like when I teach I do all my own things um and I don't know if I can put that in a book like you know somehow it feels like a book is a little more stale than than what happens in my class so can one really capture your idiosyncrasies that you think make a class go well um in a book so kind of two questions about now, when is it work or when are there other mechanisms to get it out there? And then how do you like if I could just, I, I just want to, again, not to interrupt what other people are saying, but let me just share my screen for just a second. Um, I, uh, I don't know if you could see my, my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, I've written my entire textbook in Mathematica. Um, and this is showing you an exercise that I have the students do at the end of chapter seven. This should look familiar. This is the Lorentz attractor. Um, and I, I'm not showing the problem. The problem is to create this manipulate. But in Mathematica, the beauty is that you can change the initial conditions. You can immediately see that this looks very different at the end. Uh, and then you can also do the uh, phase plot and you can see what happens as you play with the initial conditions. You can also see as you alter the parameters uh, exactly where the attractor is going to go. So again, because I'm dealing with biology students who are very used to dealing with looking at dynamic systems. My entire textbook, uh, which is available to freely download online, I'll talk about it as I say at five o'clock, uh, is all in Mathematica so that the students can do all this almost instantly. Um, and so I just, I would commend that to you as a, one way of, of addressing this question. And I, I just also want to say that I can update and I can be as idiosyncratic as I want, but I can update my text all the time because it's a live text. Um, What's the title of the book? It's called Dynamics of Biological Systems. 
and I'll give the link to it when I speak at five o'clock. Um, but if people want to, I'll just put in my email email address here. If anybody is interested, they can just send me an email, and I'll, I'll give you uh, the link. But that's that's the way in which I'm responding to Frank's very good question. Sammy, did you have something to contribute? Yeah, I, I guess I I, I got it. I, I got excited because folks like like Frank and and Victor and others were talking about how do you make it interactive and 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 I hope you know some of you saw my presentation on my on my wiki model application and so I'm trying to do the same thing as as you guys but not with a textbook with a piece of software and so I also have I'm struggling you know I think we're I'm capable programmer and things like that but I struggle mm -hmm. on the networking on the part of me of pub of 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 letting people know that it exists and having people use it and so i'm hoping that uh you know that i'm trying to do the same thing but with software and not books and with me if i if nobody uses it i still pay google and amazon a monthly fee because it's on the cloud so <clears throat> and i don't mind doing that i you know my purpose for making the software was to help students uh, understand the value in mathematics and not get bogged down by by not necessarily understanding the mathematical implementation of of models, but to get excited about it. Um, and so I'm hoping, you know, that maybe software like that can also make courses more more interactive. Yeah, uh, Carrie, you had a comment. Oh, well, yeah, the, this is just such a wonderful panel uh, conversation. Uh, I just had a uh, very uh, direct nuts and bolts question is uh, in terms of workflow and and software for for figures and illustrations um, i'm coming from where i wrote a, a book in 2019 with a co-author on um, model testing it was oxford university press and if if my co-author wasn't it, so skilled as he was with illustrator uh, the book probably would still be sitting uh, unpublished that uh, uh, just the, sometimes these the the nuts and bolts issue yeah. important. So I'm just curious what what you do for that. You find a collaborator is what you've done, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, in my case, all my figures are MATLAB generated, and uh, one of the features of my book is that um, I have a suite of 22 really simple MATLAB programs that go along with the book. Uh, and some of the exercises ask students to change scenarios or change the differential equation. Um, and so I just used more, I just used very specialized versions of those programs for each figure. Right. I, I, I didn't mean so much as plots because those are, are, as you say, ah. easy to generate. I meant literally where you have to make a, a figure or an illustration yeah. of like a system. Yeah, I see. I, I don't have anything like that to worry about. Or it, or a photograph or something, you know, just any any graphic that you want. And uh, traditionally, publishers provided that, but I think a number of us are finding out you they just want the final manuscript. You know, they're not ready to jump in. Uh, one year, I was in Paul Zorn's office up at uh, Saint Olaf's, and the phone rang, and you know, I said, "Should I leave?" And he goes, "No, stay." So I turned around, and there was a blackboard that was just filled with stuff, one, two, three, four, five, 27, 28, 29. And I, he got off the phone, I go, what is that? He goes, those are the steps you have to do to do a calculus book. <laughs> and uh, he and his colleague had written it and it was just staggering. You know.